Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just going to give everyone a few minutes to join the call. But if you're already in, go ahead and uh, share where you're tuning in from in the chat. Irvine, California. Oh, I'm from the LA area. Nice to see someone close. Austin, Texas, awesome. <laughs> New York, Barcelona, wow. It's a good group. Canada, Amsterdam, Virginia. Oh, San Diego, hello. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules before we get into this chat today with Brian Finster. Um, first off, this meeting is going to be recorded, so please don't do anything you don't want to live on the internet forever. Um, after, we will send you this video and all the other resources that you'll need from this talk via email. Um, super excited to have this AMA chat with Brian Finster. Um, so please jump in with your questions if you have them. You can use the chat, just make sure it's visible to everyone, or alternatively, you can use the Q&A feature that's built in. Um, we're super excited to hear your questions um, and get to know a little bit about your platform stories and how they relate to what we're going to talk about today. So don't be shy. But awesome. Good to see all of you. Um, Today, I'm here with Brian Finster. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Brian Finster. I've been a software engineer for um, quite a few years. Um, I currently work for Defense Unicorns, where we're trying to solve some really interesting delivery problems. If you can imagine water-gapped delivery of software, <clears throat> um, you know, to like submarines and things. Um, before that, I spent 19 years working at Walmart, most of that in supply chain, uh, which I worked in supply chain software before that, before Walmart, and then later uh, moved to Walmart's platform uh, when we were developing a global platform as part of a broader strategy of how do we improve engineering excellence in the organization uh, using continuous delivery as the tool to improve things. Um, I was uh, originally responsible for the metrics part of the platform and then later founded the Walmart DevOps Dojo where we were working directly with teams to help them with the day to day of how do you do continuous delivery in real life. Uh, because we discovered pretty early on that giving people tools doesn't mean they're now doing continuous delivery. It means that they can just cut their hands off faster if we don't help them. So that's who I am. Uh, I'm also, I write quite a bit about this problem of how do we make every working environment a better place to work. I, I mean, developers should live better lives and working this way yields better lives. And there's a lot of things we have to fix to do that. And that's what I focus on. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you. Um, I guess to start, do you want to share a little bit more about your experience with Walmart um, and sort of highlight in more detail some of the things that you learned um, from working with that setup? Well, I learned that most of the time we were delivering software incorrectly. Uh, the, you know, I spent a long time going through, um, you know, I joined, we were first checking in code for the first time, which was astounding to me. Um, but then, you know, they taught us all about project management. They sent us all through PA, you know, all the senior engineers through Project Management Institute training. Uh, then later they switched us to Agile and it turned into two week uh, waterfall, you know, with Gantt charts for two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we had this challenge I thought was that really changed the path of several of our careers. And that was, we had our main warehouse management system. They wanted us to deliver it every two weeks. We were delivering it every quarter. Um, and usually, well, no, not usually. We delivered every quarter and there was a scheduled at least one week, 24 hour support war room that you were scheduled in to pick up the pieces after the delivery. Uh, they then wanted us, and it's this right out of the Phoenix Project, just read the Phoenix Project or the Unicorn Project. That was my life. Um, and then they wanted us to figure out how to deliver it every two weeks. And they gave us a lot of free, you know, the VP is like, just tell us what we need to do and we'll support you. And so we started digging in to continuous delivery. I mean, we literally bought the book, 
Um, we did a lot of work around, uh, you know, leveraging Conway's law. How do we do a reverse Conway to decouple the application? How do we restructure teams? All of these things are very disciplined about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, started really hammering at the problems. Why can't we deliver daily and solving those problems as they came up. And when I finally left that area, the team I was on, we were delivering 10 to 12 times a day to production, getting feedback from a distribution center on Slack immediately with suggestions. Hey, how, what if we tried this? Not even defects. Um, and the, the thing that I, that was an unex, unexpected benefit was just the incredibly huge morale improvement that we had on the team. Uh, you know, the, the, the just a, so much better, better way to work. And we just wanted that for everybody. And so when I moved to platform, that was the goal is, Hey, how do we help every team at Walmart get that way? And then ultimately, how do we help everybody in the world? Because, I don't want to go work somewhere that we can't work this way. Yeah. It sounds like your team had to do a lot of like work and research to sort of get to that spot. Is there, yeah, we were learning on our own. <laughs> yeah. I guess, is there something that organizations can do to like better facilitate that process, um, make it easier for developers or platformers to. There are, I mean, uh, so for example, uh, Gary Gruber has released some, uh, you know, a book called engineering, the digital transformation, uh, with a, a accompanying online training, uh, and just a disciplined approach mm -hmm. to engineering this process, what it is you're actually trying to do. It's really nuts and bolts. It's also very good for leadership to understand if what it is we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Accelerate came out and talked about some of the core things that we learned along the way and just confirmed that we were, we'd actually gotten a lot of things really, really right in first pass, which was astounding. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, good books out there about this. Uh, there's a lot of good material. There's a lot of garbage. I, I like ranting about scaled agile framework because it's, you know, I consider it complete antithesis to where we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. But, you know, focusing on that content about how do we solve this problem? Team topologies is important. You have to understand how the organizational structure impacts your delivery. I mean, all the architecture of the entire organization has to change in a lot of cases to deliver this way. And, but, you know, start at the team. Why can't we deliver today? Look at those resources. Look at why. Uh, and just one other thing, there's a community project that we started last year called minimumcd.org, um, where we're laying out, this is how to start. I mean, this is like the basics here. So, you know, just like if, you, if you're not actually doing continuous delivery, solve mm -hmm. these problems, then go on to the more complicated things. Yes, yes, yeah, that makes sense. Um, in terms of like, I guess, a larger strategy for like building a platform, implementing it. Yeah. How would you describe going about that? What are some best practices that people can incorporate? So we had a, a few things we were trying to do, right? I mean, number one, um, the founder of the platform was Jason Benzel. And, and Jason, uh, he's one of those quiet people in the background that has had massive impact in the industry, if you just Google him. Um, he's really focused on, we wanted a good open source solution we wanted to open source the entire platform. Now, leadership changed before we could open source all of it. We did open source part of it. But um, he wanted an open source solution. He wanted it to be handled like a good open source project. Got it. And meaning that good documentation, um, good developer advocacy, right? Uh, the, you know, everything that's surrounded to make something useful. Yeah. Uh, he wanted us to make sure that we were focusing on what does the customer actually need. Mm -hmm. But one of those customers was the enterprise. And mm -hmm. so we'd have teams asking us for things who were contrary to continuous delivery. Well, no, the platform is optimized to make CD the easy path to deliver everything else, not impossible. And so they still get requests. Hey, can you make it easier for me to implement GitFlow? And the answer is no. GitFlow will not get you to continuous delivery, so we're, that's not on our roadmap, you know. But we're happy to help you learn CD. <laughs> Got it. So it sounds but like the, the broader strategy was about the CD, which was informed by this product approach, but not. Yeah, it, it, was, it was. It was making the platform easy to use so that you can implement CD, giving people the information for how to do that, having excellent documentation. 
Uh, we did a lot of things around force multiplication. It was, a, you know, you have to think, sure, it's Walmart and Walmart's a Fortune 1 company. But when I left platform globally, there was 80 people in the delivery platform area for the entire supporting nine, nearly 19,000 developers globally, 24 seven high availability platform. And you know, there's things we did like having really good documentation, having support processes that enabled us to not have very large support teams, you know, and, uh, and really focusing on how do we do this in a very efficient, effective way. Uh, we wanted, you know, it was opinionated, but it was not opinionated to the point where, no, you're not allowed to do that. We're not police, right? We're just trying to make it opinionated so it was easy to do the right thing. Yeah. So that she would just naturally flow that way. Yeah. I guess you've touched a little bit on this in your last answer, but it sounds like there are lots of different things that you have to balance. You know, going yeah. into a platform, you want to improve, like, workflows, developer experience, tooling, everything else. So how do you decide what to prioritize? Um, and how do you like break down each of those problems into something that you can manage or solve? Well, you know, first you, you don't want to boil the ocean. I'm sure that people hear that quite a bit. We didn't try to go and create a global platform. Uh, that was the goal, but we didn't start with global platform, right? Mm -hmm. We started with, okay, we had a bunch of different delivery problems we had to solve. We had uh, going to metal, um, uh, you know, we at the edge and stores and distribution centers. We uh, had private cloud where dot com was residing and we were moving into public cloud as well. And we needed to be able to handle all of those delivery problems. Um, and so we just picked the most common one that was the easiest to solve to test out our ideas, right? So we, we started off with Java going to private cloud, right? Because we had all total control over that and Java was the, the major language or a big chunk of what's being developed there. And so we started there. And then we um, started just growing out our capabilities. The other thing is we didn't start with a full featured platform. We started with an abstraction of Jenkins to do CI and delivery. Later, as we started building out the rest of the tool suite, you know, we would limit Jenkins to just CI because we had now a good orchestration tool uh, that you can go out there and write, look right now. It's concord.walmartlabs.com. That's our orchestration tool that we built. And we had this really good orchestration tool to allow us to do everything else. So then we started having much more segregation of concerns in the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just evolved over time. You know, we added in uh, the ability to have, um, you know, a compliance engine in the platform that would allow us to implement policy as code, mm -hmm. you know, just built it out as we went. And would you say that was a successful approach? Is there anything that you learned about, I guess, like the order that you did everything in? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, from a, if, if I were to do it better, I probably would have brought the compliance stuff further forward mm -hmm. and had uh, an earlier partnership with the audit department. Uh, I think that, you know, it would have helped reduce friction later on when they start screaming because people have moved away from the, you know, change boards. And now we've got integration in with ServiceNow and we're just publishing change records as part of the pipeline. So you just hit deploy and you get a change record and compliance started freaking out about that yeah. uh, because we didn't establish a relationship early on. And then we had to kind of repair that relationship, right? But having baking compliance in the platform um, allows us to go fast. That means that we don't have compliance picking up the pieces and doing things like slamming on the brakes and saying, no, you have to go through a three-day change process before you can deploy the production. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of like gathering feedback from the developers and I guess other stakeholders like compliance, um, yeah. how did you go about doing that? What did you learn from that process? What would you recommend for others to do? Well, I mean, first, when we started building it out, we didn't just build it out and say, now you have to use it. I mean, we started off with the idea that ultimately, we know that in a few years, everyone's going to be forced onto the platform. It's just be the corporate direction. But we want everybody, we want almost everybody, because you're always going to have those people. 
We want <laughs> almost everybody to want to use it because it's better than their current solution. Yeah. So that mindset there is super important. Mm -hmm. uh, we started partnering with some power users who had specific problems. We tried to work to solve their specific problems uh, and, and, you know, take their criticisms seriously and partner with them and, and try to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we had incredibly active Slack channels where, you know, we, we get a lot of feedback from developers uh, on things on Slack or problems they're seeing or, or whatever, right? And so every tool had its own Slack channel. And then the, you know, the dojo, we had our Slack channel. I mean, you're looking at two or 3,000 people giving you feedback every single day. You get some feedback, but then also from, you know, so the, the product owners for each tool. And so we were all engineers and so technical product owners, but we would actively go out and seek people uh, and just have conversations with them at multiple levels and, and find out what problems they're having, you know, what things aren't we solving today? Hey, I, we notice you're using harness. Why are you using harness? Uh, how can we fit your needs so you don't have to pay for that anymore? That sort of thing. Got it. I'm curious, what was the most surprising piece of feedback that you received during this process? The most surprising piece of feedback? Uh, I honestly, I don't know. I, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we've, um, there's, there was always people who were pushing back because their particular favorite workflow, which didn't align with CD didn't work very well. Uh, and you know, there was always, that would happen occasionally. Uh, and they didn't respond well to, Hey, we'd love to help you learn continuous delivery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have the, we have the, 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 the bandwidth to teach you CD, like in, in detail mm -hmm. in your context, you know, not just theoretically. Um, but uh, I, I would say that the, you know, when I left, you know, we were looking at covering 90% of Walmart use cases, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just so much, you know, that, that was the majority platform. There was anybody using another platform was an extreme edge case. Got it. Um, got it. And, and so, I know that when I left, you know, as the dojo owner, I got a lot of feedback from people um, that honestly wish I could have had feedback while I was there because there's it's it's hard trying to help people um, that that my team had done a really good job and they were really thankful for the help that we'd given them. Mm. So, so that was nice, but I can't think of anything really surprising. Interesting. Um, you sort of mentioned like this not explicitly, but like almost like having a golden path for people um, with, yeah. you know, the tools and the support that you're providing. Can you share a little bit more about how Walmart figured out, you know, what that path should look like, um, how you found the right level of abstraction for your developers? Uh, I'd say that we had a, a couple of people who knew what good looked like. You know, Jason would always talk about his time working in Switzerland in the FinTech and how he, he moved there and he was shocked because people came to work at nine and went home at five and didn't take support calls because everything worked and they could rebuild the entire system from version control with the push of a button, right? Mm -hmm. So he knew what good looked like, you know, he'd been doing it for a while. Um, and uh, so having people that understand that, no, it, it can actually be this. You know, mm. this isn't some theoretical thing and then just working towards it and explaining to everybody else. And so I think that's super important. You know, it, this, you, you've got to go and, and have those stories or, or find people who have those stories to share those stories. You know, it's one of the things I do is I'll go talk to other organizations about, hey, this is, this is real. You know, this yeah. isn't some fantasy thing or just throwing crap over the wall real fast. Now, I will say that, uh, you know, I think it's incredibly important people understand that the tools don't get you there. It's it's how to use the tools. You know, the, one of the reasons for minimumcd.org is we're seeing things where people are being given tools and then they, and but not changing how they do work, not improving how they test, not not understanding the entire purpose of the pipeline is to prevent bad things from happening. And your job is to harden the pipeline to make that happen. Yeah. Um, it's just build and deploy automation. They blow things up and then, you know, CD gets a bad name in an organization and gets banned. And so, you know, it's important if you're focusing on platform that you're also bringing it with 
education of how to effectively use the platform to do what we're trying to do and not just say, here, here's tools. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of also like guiding folks journey through the platform, can you talk a little about a little bit about the metrics that you can use to gauge your success? I know you wrote a little bit about how to leverage the door metrics. Um, so feel yeah, free well, to the door metrics that. aren't our success. That's that's their success, and those mm -hmm. can you know, uh, yeah. I wrote a paper for IT Revolution where I talked about how to misuse and abuse door metrics because uh, those are currently frequently being misused, abused, misunderstood. There's all these problems with the door metrics that mm -hmm. are easily solved if people read past page 19 and accelerate. Uh, <laughs> let's just read the damn book, um, but. You know, how we knew we were successful was that people didn't complain too much, I, th I think. You know, we had a lot, we had a big customer base. Um, uh, you know, it's very hard in platform to know that you're helping. Um, it, because the only time you really hear from people is when they're mad at you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, or they need help. Right, but it's never. Hey, you guys are doing a great job. And there was like, um, there was you know, a debate about whether we should have uh, uh, um, NPS surveys. And I mm -hmm. and, and I was pushing back on that. And I was like, you know, the the last thing I want for my platform tooling is for it to stop me uh, and ask me questions. Uh, I should be if I'm a good platform. You shouldn't even know I exist. I'm just in the background doing my thing, and you don't even know I'm around. You know. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, you know, utilization, really, what's yeah. like anything else, right? I mean, what's, how stable are we? How fast can we recover from a platform outage? Um, mm -hmm. And how, what's our utilization look like, you know, based off of our uh, expected customer base? I mean, we know how many teams we have. Uh, what percentage of penetration do we have in the teams? And how do we increase that? It's, it's, you know, just like any other product, right? It's just focusing on it as a product and not as a, just, oh, we're a service to the company and do what we mm. say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm just seeing our first question, um, which is, do you build tools for platform and open source it? Um, depends. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, back to the context we were working in, Fortune One company with $600 billion worth of sales, buying tools in that sort of environment is so expensive, mm. right? I mean, just, just Slack licenses. So we use Slack, it's $100 a year per person. Multiply that by, you know, 18 and a half, 19,000 developers, plus everybody else using Slack who's not a developer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it gets really expensive. I remember talking to uh, a, uh, a, a, you know, an operations uh, dashboarding company, which I won't name. Um, and this is back when I worked in logistics and, and I was at DevOps Enterprise Summit and they of course grabbed me because they saw Walmart on my badge and started asking me about their thing. I'm like, oh yeah, I love your tool. It's super cool. I can't afford it. I yeah. said the the uh, quote I got for just rolling it out just to the distribution centers was something like fifty four million dollars a year. So, yeah, we'll probably just have to build something, right? Yeah. If you work for a you know medium sized company, don't go build your platform. I mean, there's good platforms out there that you can just buy, and it's not a core capability for your company unless you're a platform company. And so you've the, the bill versus buy, it's it's just a cost benefit analysis. How much does it cost us to do one versus the other? And the cost isn't the building, it's operating, yeah. maintaining, keeping it secure. I mean, there's all these uh, things you have to think about. So there's not an easy answer for that. That makes sense. Um, I guess, are there other things that you learned that were like specific to the platform journey at Walmart, where you were like, if I was in a different context at a different company, maybe it didn't have to be this way. But you know, we have a specific challenge at Walmart, and this is how we're gonna. I, I honestly don't think so. I think Walmart, because I've uh, ever since I started the dojo at Walmart, I spent a lot of time because there's the Enterprise Dojo Consortium, which is made up of a bunch of Fortune 100 companies. Mm -hmm. 
And I just kind of got in the habit of calling up people in other companies and just having conversations about comparing notes on problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the thing that was special about Walmart was I got to see almost all of the problems that you'll see in a lot of different companies in one spot because it's just a giant organization of very small, of like medium sized companies. If you think about how things are organized, right? Mm -hmm. And so you'll see almost everything. I've, I've not been surprised um, about, by anything since I left Walmart. You know? <laughs> And now I work with the DOD and I'm still not surprised. So, um, so no, there's nothing really special uh, the, about Walmart other than the fact that, you know, we really had to think about scale. And so if you compare us to like Target, we and Target did things in very different ways when it came to like just teaching people how to deliver better. Mm. Um, and the strange thing is that we did it with much less cost. <laughs> Uh, now, um, you know, because we, we had to think about how do we operate at scale without burying ourselves in overhead because we're paying for it on the margin with bananas, you know, it's. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, I, I think a lot of companies have the same problems. And when it comes to platforms, uh, I've seen a lot of anti-patterns around platforms. Uh, I had someone at. <laughs> at a conference asked me how we managed uh, um, all the pipelines because he was struggling with managing 300 pipelines. And I said, why would you manage the pipelines? <laughs> That's, those belong to the teams. You give them tools so that they can easily manage their pipelines. Mm -hmm. You don't configure everything yourself. You just, that's, that's a <laughs> great way to die, right? I mean, you're just burying yourself in, in, in overhead. So, you know, the, the struggles are the same uh, where, you know, platform either isn't seen as a product, uh, it's not seen as a product at all. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, platforms sometimes see themselves as police to hammer people in submission. We're going to set policy. We're going to set direction. We're in charge. No, it's servant leadership. We're trying to help you. We're also trying to help you succeed uh, uh, where the enterprise needs you to go. Yeah, you know, you have to have that servant leadership and customer centric mindset, but one of the customers is the enterprise and strike that balance. Makes a lot of sense. We have another question from Carolina, which is, is the platform you built at Walmart still in usage today? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it keeps getting better. Um, I, in fact, I had one of my old teammates give a presentation at platform one about the way the platforms currently being used and the, and the things that they're, they've been doing there. Um, you know, they've, I, I've got, uh, I, I gave a talk where I had some slides at the end that showed one of my other teammates who was delivering a different platform tool mm -hmm. that was not really a delivery platform. And he was literally using a, uh, a, a an easy button wired to a Raspberry Pi to deploy change. Right. And so, yeah, it's still being used. Awesome. That's really great. Um, another question. Also, for those of you watching, if you have your questions, feel free to send them in, um, either the Q&A function or the chat. Well, Radha had a question here I'd love to answer. Is, is, yes. is platform engineering the same as infrastructure engineering or DevOps engineering? So I have a really strong opinion about DevOps engineering and specifically. Uh, and there's many of us out there with this opinion. So don't be surprised if you run into them. Um, I use Donovan Brown's definition of DevOps. DevOps is the union of people, process, and product to enable the continuous delivery of value to the end user, which means that DevOps is the entire way the entire organization operates to deliver value mm -hmm. and has uh, about 5% tools, okay? So if, there, if DevOps engineer meant what it should mean, to equate to that, then a DevOps engineer would be engineering value streams and not playing with tools, right? I mean, yeah. tooling is part of it. You have to understand the tools, but that's not the job if you're trying to engineer for a DevOps, okay? Uh, 
I much prefer platform engineer for what a lot of DevOps engineers are doing. Um, mm-hmm. Some DevOps engineers are in support organizations. Uh, there's, there's no standard definition for DevOps engineer. I can, I can point to three or four off the top of my head, and there's probably more out there. Some DevOps engineers are actually doing what I'm, I'm saying that they should be doing, but they're rare. Mm-hmm. Um, infrastructure engineering, um, you know, I, I think of it, personally, I think of infrastructure as the thing that platforms lay on. <laughs> so I've got somebody who's like making sure the database is there, but then I have database platform engineering to make it easy to consume the database so you don't have to open a ticket to get it configured or something, right? And so platform engineering is really, from my, in my head, platform engineering is how do we make it easy for people to consume tools mm-hmm. so that they don't have to get in the details of how those tools are, are configured. All they have to say is, I need this tool, please. Really so like it's, it. it's, it's just working as, you know, how do we remove friction from the delivery process? That's platform engineering to me. Got it. Well, that's a great definition. Um, I guess... A similar question in terms of breadth, but uh, how different is central infrastructure from platforms? Uh, I mean, from an organizational perspective, I don't think they are. Uh, I mean, I think they're very closely related, mm-hmm. but you know, at least in our area, infrastructure was a different director from delivery platform. And then we had database platform, which was a different director from delivery platform. And so we had these defined domains that we're working in, which I highly recommend that you always have a clear domain of what it is you're supposed to be doing because platform can bury itself by trying to take on more than it was intended to do. Um, but I mean, they're related, Got it. but it's, 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 it's different. I mean, like I said, the infrastructure is a platform lays on top of it's critical, uh, but generally isn't a slightly different focus. Got it. Thank you. We have another question from Patrick, which is, was the Walmart platform team doing anything to extend to citizen development? I need clarification on the definition of citizen development. Let's see, Patrick, if you don't mind sending that into the chat, <laughs> we'll be able to work on that one. Because I, 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 I do not know. Yes, okay, I'll keep an eye out for that one. Um, in the meantime, I want to go back to this idea of platform teams not becoming like law enforcement um, or like forcing developers to adopt this platform that they might not necessarily like. How did you go about counteracting that? We're trying to solve your problem. We're trying to help you. Yeah. I mean, it's literally, how can we help? You know, and I I think a lot of it, it helped that we had, you know, a lot of people in platform had been at Walmart for a while. And that's really the Walmart culture is that servant leadership, you know, customer focus. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. If I walked, if I left the office and went to Walmart to go shopping, I forgot to take off my badge. A customer asked me where something was. I was expected to take them to that thing. I see. Yeah. And so it's that focus on, you know, service mm-hmm. and that's what platforms should be doing and that's what everybody who's not delivering the final solution should be doing is to be servants to them security compliance all of us should be focused on how do we help those people deliver value better mm-hmm. not we're the police we need to slow you down and stop you uh also uh rada had a question of comparing it to sre sre is completely different from infrastructure or platform. I mean, SRE is about operational stability. It's, I mean, if a good SRE organization should be telling me as a, uh, on a product team that I'm exceeding my air budgets, you know, and give me the air cover to say, no, we can't keep pushing features because we're uns- too, too unstable. We need to stabilize, you know, or give me tips on how to be operationally stable. And so that's a different discipline than platform engineering. where like trying to engineer solutions to make it easier for you to do your daily work. And it's, so I, I see them as distinctly different things. So we did get a definition for citizen development, um, which is regular business people being able to create software specific for their business task without having to understand all of the tools. 
Well, so if you, let me give you an example of, you know, the easy button delivery process at Walmart. It's incredibly declarative. You put the, you, you know, you need to know a little bit about version control to use it. Mm -hmm. So you need to know Git and you need to know, and be able to navigate GitHub, but you don't have to understand Kubernetes uh, to, you know, in about 30 lines of YAML say, okay, I have a Java application. Uh, these are the different environments I need for testing. Here's the uh, location of my health check endpoint because you had to provide that. And you could just commit that with your Java application and then it would automatically get containerized and deployed to a Kubernetes cluster and you'd be uh, sent messages on Slack to tell you the status of the build and deploy. And then, hey, here's the URL for your new Kubernetes deploy. And if you need a friendlier URL, then you know, open a ticket and have DNS set it up for you. And mm -hmm. so you didn't have to know uh, anything about Jenkins. You didn't have to know anything about Concord. You didn't have to know anything about Docker, Kubernetes, anything. Mm -hmm. All you had to know is how to write code and how to use GitHub and, and read the instructions on how to configure a pipeline that just says, do the thing and it does the thing, right? And so, yeah, I mean, we did a lot of work around that. We wanted it, the, the goal again was that your job on a product team is already hard enough. You need to understand a business problem and, and how to solve it. You shouldn't have to understand the intricacies of the tools to get it done. That's our job to help you. Um, we have another question from Rada. Um, they're trying to strengthen their skills in platform engineering mm -hmm. um, currently as an infrastructure engineer into configuration. And they ask which language is good to learn, Python or Golang? Um, and how can I get into writing a tool useful for platform engineering so I can get into the field? Hard question, all of our tools are written in Java. <laughs> so uh, it's it's like any other development job though, right? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna move to another job where we're doing supply chain software. What, what language are you writing the supply chain software in? I guess I'll need to learn that language if I don't already know it. Uh, I'll say that in the, the world where there's more and more focus on using Kubernetes, that Golang is gonna be your natural choice. Uh, I've not run into a lot of uh, platform engineering done with Python, but it, I'm sure it exists because it's a big, you know, it, it's a big field we're in. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I, I think it depends where you want your focus to be. So if you if you really want to focus on, on things like, hey, I want to manage Kubernetes clusters and, and make it easy for people to use those, then Golang is going to be your choice. Yeah, I guess beyond like those specific skills, are there other resources or tools that you would recommend for people who want to move into platform engineering? That one, I don't know. I kind of fell into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I was I was brought in because they, not because I had a deep background in infrastructure. I do not. I've been a, I've developed, you know, like enterprise solutions for people mm -hmm. who were not developers for most of my career. I, I got brought in because I know how to do continuous delivery and I had to learn how to teach other people how to do that. And so that's that was my main focus was doing that and also giving feedback back to the platform about, hey, there's something over here that we should make better to make it easier for them, you know. Awesome. You got a thank you in the chat. <laughs> You're um, welcome. I'm hopeful, I'm glad that was helpful. My company right now we do we do exclusively GoLang because we're, you know, we're how do we deploy a Kubernetes cluster to a submarine and make it easy enough? This so this is the ultimate so citizen coding. This is what Defense Unicorns does, right? We have a problem. We need to make it so that you have a, com a, a complete in operating environment and delivery platform operating in a submarine, and we need a sailor to be able to administer it without having specialized training in, in, in the tools. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've got an open source project called Zarf, which is, you know, it's Kubernetes in a box, hit button, get platform, right? Mm -hmm. And if, it, if, if you start having problems, just hit the reboot button, turn it off, turn it back on again, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's 
cool mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, that's platform engineering. It's really focusing on making it so easy that a non-developer can do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Our next question is, can SRE be a platform product and how can it differentiate from what DevOps teams do? Well, I, I don't, again, DevOps is an operating model and in, and in 2016, I stood up on stage at Walmart for a DevOps day that I was co-hosting and, and just after coming back from DevOps Enterprise Summit and told them that you're going to start seeing jobs out there for DevOps engineers uh, mm -hmm. and DevOps teams. And I would consider that a red flag for an organization that doesn't understand DevOps. So I, 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 I know it might make people unhappy, but that's, that's just if we have a team that's focused on DevOps, then the organization's not focused on DevOps and it's an organizational operating model. You don't have any DevOps teams in the Phoenix project. You have a complete change in how parts unlimited works. And that's what DevOps is. Yeah. Uh, I, whether SRE falls under uh, a platform organization or, uh, or not, I, I think that's um, a decision that that organization makes. But again, I, SRE is you know, really focused on how do we help the product teams deliver more stable things? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, platforms, how do we help them deliver things more easily? And this is how we make it help deliver it more stable. Uh, it might align, it might not. It just depends on the culture of that organization. Makes sense. Um, another question from Josh is, how do you measure or observe the economic impacts on other engineering teams from platform improvements? Indirectly. <laughs> um, so for example, if you've gone from, we deliver once a month, with a lot of defects. Mm -hmm. um, and if only we had faster feedback, we can make that better. And then you give them the tools and knowledge to get faster feedback and they're able to deliver more frequently with lower defects. What's the economic benefit of that, right? Mm -hmm. So they're able to, the, you've got the cost of delay that's been reduced. You've got the uh, rework that's been reduced, right? And mm -hmm. so the trick is measuring that. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest trying to find a way to measure some of that because ultimately you're going to be questioned, why are we spending all this money on people who aren't actually delivering anything to our end users? It's like, because we're enabling other people to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so and I would, I would try to measure some of those things. How are defects rates and defect rates across the company trending? How are delivery rates across the company trending? Use the Dora metrics to see the real ones, not the ones people frequently is, uh, and most of the tool vendors out there are implementing them incorrectly, just FYI. So don't trust them. Um, but yeah, I mean, and track those things and say, okay, we are claiming this reduction in defects and this improvement in this delivery as part of our value add. Awesome. Um, I think our last <clears throat> question from Ash. We didn't do that, by the way. I'm saying <laughs> that's something we should have done better. <clears throat> Let's see. Our last question from Ashton is, in your opinion, platform engineering, in your opinion, where will platform engineering as a distinction be in the <clears throat> five to 10 years? Crap. I don't... <laughs> 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 That's a really good question. Uh, I mean, hopefully... In my perfect world, it'll it'll get pushed to, we understand that it's a valuable product, we understand the value of doing it, uh, that we are, that we've got more open source platforms out there that uh, enable the, you know, citizen development that was asked about, right? That are super easy to use, that you can just go to GitHub and pull it down, and now you have a platform that works really well. And that's ultimately what our vision was at Walmart, and again, leadership changed before we could accomplish that. Yeah. Uh, they had different priorities. So <clears throat> that's where I hope it will be. I really hope it doesn't just, you know, continue to be a, a whole bunch of confusing partial implementations of platforms that people have to integrate in and learn about and that makes developers' lives harder. Developers should live better lives, whether they're on platform teams or on product teams, wherever they are. Makes sense. I can squeeze in a bonus question from Mike. 
Um, he says in his company, which is a mobile agency, most of the teams have QAs that do manual testing and only ship a couple times a month. <sighs> do you have any tips on how to start the transformation and promote benefits of DevOps practices to other teams or members? Yes, because it's my <laughs> primary job every single day was to do that, you know, uh, and we had a pretty disciplined approach to doing that. Mm -hmm. Number one, does the team want help? And if they don't, walk away because nothing you can do will help them because all they'll do is fight you and then claim you're talking about theory and crap like that, uh, you know, and if they don't want help, that doesn't mean they won't always want help try to sell them on the fact that this is actually a, a safer way to deliver. It's more secure. It's better quality. You know, as long as you actually focus on quality, then you start explaining things around how this manual testing process you have, you're not manually testing anything. You're manually verifying the last change, but you're not also manually verifying every other change you've ever made is also not work, not broken. And there's no, feasible way you can do that beyond a very small, small application. Not only that, but humans can't reliably repeat steps. So it's not a test because it's not repeatable. If you have a failure, you can't repeatably repeat the failure and identify where it is with the manual test. Sorry, I've tested manually for most of my career and I know that this is true. Um, and so you start talking about things like, look, uh, we're going to have defects. We know we're going to have defects. The only question is how many defects do we want to find at one time and how far in the future do we want to find them and then struggle to figure out how to fix them. What we need to do is start shortening our feedback loops. You'll hear Dave Farley talk about this all the time. In fact, today on LinkedIn, he posted, says if there's only one improvement you make, it's mm -hmm. shorten your feedback loops, right? Um, and so what we need to do is we need to start breaking stuff down and get to where we are adding more and more test automation for the things that we know that break. And this will take time, right? But we start with, we never push untested code. And then we go with the next thing. And you can read about this and like managing ledger, because I forget the exact title of the book, but it's, it's a book about how to handle legacy software mm -hmm. is that all of the software we have is legacy software because it's untested. Uh, as we start making changes, we increase the amount that it's tested. The stuff that's running in production is tested in production. We know that's a st we know what that state is, right? But we can't make any other changes without getting good tests around this. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's also look at how do we test better? And so teaching people how to test, measure things around defect rates, measure the time it takes to complete a story, like, you know, from started to done. Um, and what we would do is we drive that down to below two days for a story. And because two days is a quality thing. If it's more than that, number one, we're not gonna reliably deliver it in three or five or seven days or however long, whatever Fibonacci number you wanna pick, just stop story pointing and break things down small. Um, but not only that, but the bigger it is, the more vague it is because we're, it's like a giant code review. You, you suck at giant code reviews. Everybody does. You're not going to find any defects in a giant code review. You only find them in small code reviews. The same thing with stories. You're not going to find defects in a small story, in a big story. You're going to have a lot of assumptions that are uncovered, and then you're going to be struggling with rework, break things down. So how long does it take to deliver a story? How long does it take for us to get in production? How long does, you know, how many defects are we generating? Let's identify why these things are, are going the wrong way or not where we want them to be. Let's methodically make them better. When we, the very first team we were on, it was, you know, when we were starting this logistics, why can't I get code on trunk today? And then later, why can't I deliver today? And just hammer at those problems that we have to go to production today. Anything else that's in our way is wrong. Mm -hmm. So given that, what do we need to fix? And you just start with that baseline, right? Um, People won't believe it. Uh, we get on teams and for the first six week engagement for the first three weeks, they wouldn't believe it. Mm. And then they would start seeing things better. And then they would dive in. And so you have to get them past, you know, it's like you need to get them to operate on faith for just a little bit of time and explain to them why it's better. Uh, yeah. The other thing that we would do is we value stream map their current process. There's teams I have value stream maps still where I would value stream map and they would have a testing team as a parallel team. And I could 
I, I can now just predict that if you have a testing team, you have terrible quality. 100% because the testing team is getting the same requirements you are, um, except that they're probably interpreting them differently than you. You don't know who's correct until you go and run the test and then you do a triage process. And I saw this again and again and again in reality with value stream maps. Mm. Uh, and so if you look at you know how to do a value stream map, just simply, right? You know, it's like these are the steps between idea to delivery, every single step, how long each step takes, what the wait time is between each step, where the rework loops are in each step, and then start hammering away at the problems. These are our problems. And you probably just don't know that they're problems because you're just used to them every single day. Makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, if you go to dojoconsortium.org, there's a lot of, we open sourced all the Walmart playbooks around this. Uh, and so there's a lot of good information out there. At least we think it was good information. It worked for us, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's very agnostic of whatever tools or organization you're in. Yeah, let's see. We have one more question from Jamie. Um, on the topic of not being police, how would you navigate the following? Everyone agrees on the delivery vision on paper, but seems mm. busy to engage on getting into a baseline state. We uh, gamified the metrics. So the second tool we built after continuous, you know, after our, uh, our CI tool, was we brought in Hygia from Capital One. We put, a, which is a delivery metrics. It's a delivery health dashboard for pipelines, and we put a, a different front end on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we we pushed our gamification back to Capital One. If you pull down Hygia, you can see the star ratings that we added uh, as a feature that you can turn on. And we gamified those metrics around CD. And mm -hmm. so it's like you get five stars on source management if you were using trunk-based development and integrating code to the trunk at least daily, you get five stars, right? Uh, you know, you get five stars for, um, you know, delivering very frequently with very low build times, you know, that sort of thing. So what happened? Well, Teams started coming to me because I was the product owner for the Hygia implementation, uh, coming to me and asking how to get five stars, right? And then we started getting so many of those requests that they said, we need a dojo. Nice. Go do that full time, right? And uh, that's, that's how we encouraged it. It was like, we, and, and we didn't say, oh, you've got, well, the other thing is, is this was a corporate strategy. The CTO mm -hmm. put out the challenge. I want every team to be able to deliver daily. So again, it was a whole strategic thing. It was platform was driving the tooling and making the, easy, the, the right thing easy, but it was still a corporate strategy that had pushed from the top, we need to do this to improve engineering excellence. Yeah. So platform can't do it alone. Got it. It's really great. Um, I think. That's it for the questions. You have any- Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't fully answer that question. We auto, and so again, just to be clear, we auto instrumented every single pipeline. So as soon as you got a pipeline, as soon as you started a pipeline on the platform, we had your data. Mm. Um, and we would send you a link to where your data was. And then we could aggregate that data and report metrics up to the CTO and say, it, globally, this is how we're doing on our goal around CD. Awesome. Yes, awesome. We have a, a thank you in the chat from Ashton. Are there any final concluding thoughts you'd like to share before we log off? Uh, only that this has been a really rewarding career change to move from product development to helping product teams with tools and information. I'll say that I, I was talking to another person from Exxon's platform several years ago. And he said, I noticed all the top developers migrate to platforms so they can be closer to their customer. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing is that there are customers. Yeah. Right? If we treat them like customers, then we get really good feedback and we can have a rewarding experience of giving them value that makes their lives better. Uh, if we treat them like victims, mm. it's a sucky, sucky job. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, do it the right way. Awesome. 
Well, thank you so much, Brian, for joining all of us and sharing your insights. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in right now for joining this conversation. Um, look out for your email with the recording of this conversation and also some links to the resources that came up over the course of the chat and have a good rest of your day, evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Well, and also just a couple of fun things. First, if anybody has any follow-up questions, they can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to engage. Uh, the other thing is if you want some fun, if you live in a terrible organization, um, if you go to um, sadmf.com, mm -hmm. that's the one framework, the Scaled Agile DevOps Maturity Framework. Uh, it's a, a little side project I work on for, this is the ultimate in terrible. Yeah. Uh, you'll you'll most people recognize something in there from their from their company uh, mm -hmm. as a terrible terrible thing it's all based off fact from multiple organizations so amazing awesome yes thank you all right thanks so much oh i'm sorry it's someone i will type the domain for everybody it's sadmf.com um i'm wearing a sadmf T-shirt. Oh, awesome. You two can be a sad MF. <laughs> awesome. Yes, you will be able to access this recorded video either from your email or we'll post it on the platform engineering website also. Um, do you want to send in your LinkedIn profile? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just Brian Fenster on LinkedIn. It's B-R-Y-A-N-F-I-N-S-T-E-R. So uh, let's see. Hang on. We go to my LinkedIn, I will post the link real quick because platform engineering, I'm supposed to make it easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a link to my LinkedIn profile. Awesome. All right, thanks everybody. Bye.